think each of us sometime during our life has wanted to paint a picture. I think there's an artist hid in the bottom of every single one of us. And Thank you, Madam we'll Chair. Uh, and Chairman Cal, it is always good to, to put it on canvas. Uh, from uh, what you are doing in your pictures. role, I too thank you for your steady leadership and stewardship uh, over the course of your tenure, but uh, maybe never so uh, important as over the course of the last 18 months and moving forward. I also thank you for your recognition that this recovery has not been even. While we are enjoying a regrowth in our economy in really robust ways, I appreciate that you recognize it has not been even uh, across all sectors. I wanted to start with the, 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 to continue the conversation around inflation. And I say this uh, as somebody who wants to be able to translate this to my constituents. Uh, I, I prefer plain English anytime we can. Uh, so I really appreciate your testimony around inflation. But if we talk about supply chain and the vulnerabilities that come in as a result uh, during this uh, economic reopening, uh, the supply chain with manufactured goods, driving what is called transitory inflation. Um, you cite in your own testimony uh, the car industry. The biggest example may be the price of used cars uh, up 10 percent uh, in April alone, uh, and a number of factors, uh, one in particular worldwide shortage of semiconductors slowing down So we always have the issue, and central banks generally always have the issue of looking at price increases and asking whether they're really threatening inflation. By inflation, we mean year after year after year prices go up. And if, if something is a one-time price increase, then you don't react to it with monetary policy. The economy is slowing down the recovery and therefore reducing inflationary pressure. So you wouldn't react to something that is likely to go away. Uh, so, so we have to look at this current situation where we have a number of categories of goods and services where inflation is moving up, as I, as I mentioned, higher and, and uh, than we've expected and a little bit more persistent than we had expected and hoped. But we look at them and we look at the story and you know the story with you mentioned around used cars and, uh, and new cars and rental cars is all it's all kind of the same story is there's a shortage of, of semiconductors. There's also very high demand for various reasons. People are using less public transportation. They have money because they haven't been able to spend. Um, and, you know, it's just the perfect storm of high demand and, and low supply. And it should pass and, unless we think there's going to be a, a multi-year, many year shortage of used cars in the United States. We should look at this as as temporary. And we, we, we very much think that it is. And so do all the forecasters that I've seen think that these price increases for used cars and new car, new cars will they'll they'll top out, and then in all likelihood at some point in the future, and we can't say exactly when, they'll decline and they die because the they will come back. And do you think you know rather than I appreciate that the, those recommendations and what your actions are, uh, is this a time when you see this kind of transitory inflation? Uh, need for greater public or private investment? I, well, I think there's a, uh, what, what investment does is it raises the potential growth rate of the country and, and makes workers more productive and, and companies more productive and countries more productive and that raises living standards and so more of it is generally better as long as it's well, money well invested, um, then, it's, then it's, it's worth looking seriously at. At any time. I agree. I would not call any of the things that we're trying to do uh, irresponsible spending. I think it, you have demonstrated and the economy has demonstrated that our investment uh, has been responsible spending uh, to the growth of our economy, to the growth of working class families. I want to pivot to uh, another thing that I care very much about. Uh, last, uh, this is credit rating agencies, last session in a bipartisan way, I ordered the Bar uh, to introduce 
uh, HR 5934, which requires the Fed to treat all nationally and recognized we will try to show rating agencies and our SROs uniformly so that more creditworthy companies could have access to the emergency lending. I knew I would run out of time. I don't know if you'd be able to speak to the NRSRO's expansions. Just briefly, I guess, um, at the very beginning of the um, crisis, we really had to get these facilities up and running, and we just uh, kind of worked with the big three. We then consistently expanded, over and over again, expanded the group of, uh, of agencies that we worked with. As you know, yeah, we can talk about this more offline if you'd like. Thank you so much. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Style, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman Powell, for being here today. I want to stay on the topic uh, of inflation. Uh, as you know, I've been a bit of a broken record on this issue because it's so important to families in Wisconsin and across our country. Uh, in fact, uh, the prospect of rising inflation, uh, I brought this up in our committee last July, again, last December. Uh, and in those meetings, you continue to suggest that you're not ready to take action to head off inflation. And yesterday, we received uh, more data confirming that prices are continuing to rise. And inflation is not an abstract concern. Families are seeing rapid price increases with their own eyes. Now, I know it's not your role to comment on fiscal policy, but I'm very concerned with President Biden's spending plans and its impact on inflation. Last month, uh, increase in consumer prices of 5.4% was the largest jump that we've seen since August of 2008, right before the financial crisis. Over the past year, used cars have gone up 30%, plane tickets have gone up 24%, shoes are up 7%. We've seen increases in coffee and sugar, cotton, propane, all double digits. And higher material costs have added $36,000 to the price of a new home. And I know you've responded to inflation concerns by saying that price increases we're seeing are temporary and they'll subside as supply chain and labor markets return to normal after COVID. But even if it's partially a case that changing and rising the prospects of a more persistent impact, in fact, a poll conducted recently showed that 87% of Americans said they're concerned about inflation. On Monday, the New York Fed reported that consumers expected to see higher inflation over the medium term. Can you comment on how the Fed responds to signs that consumers are beginning to expect more persistent inflation? Sure. So we monitor. We think inflation expectations are very, very important. Um, in a way, if businesses and households think that inflation should be 2%, then it probably will be 2% because they'll expect that and, and that they'll demand that effect. So um, we monitor, you know, inflation expectations, surveys of households, surveys of experts, the market. You can, you can, you know, as you know, you can get uh, uh, inflation compensation readings out of uh, the difference between uh, tips and regular treasuries. So we look at all of those things, and I would say they all went down as a group at the beginning of the pandemic, which is not good. And they've all moved back up as a group, just about to the level that I would say that is consistent with, in, in the range of, of consistent with our uh, with our 2% inflation goal over time. And so at the, and we watch this very carefully and we would be very concerned if they were to move persistently and materially above 2% and would react to that. So, so let me let me let me build on this discussion. I want to I want to just build in here to the distinction between the transitory and persistent inflation, in particular as it impacts home prices. According to the Case Shiller Index, home prices have risen more than 14 percent over the past year. That's a very significant increase, uh, and it's enough to put home ownership out of the reach of some Americans. Uh, meanwhile, the Fed is continuing to buy or buy around 40 billion in mortgage-backed uh, securities. And here's my concern: if inflation is, in fact, as you suggest, temporary. Does the potential abatement of inflation present a potential for a reset of housing prices? And if so, what are the likely impacts both on homeowners and what will be the impact on the Fed's MBS holdings? So housing prices, as, uh, as I'm sure you know, don't go directly into inflation. That's an asset. Housing is an asset. And housing prices, that, 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 that's not a factor in inflation. What's, what's a factor is rents. And then, uh, in effect, what the economists do is they take the value of a home and they add it. Uh, it's just the way they do it. So, um, you know, housing prices, uh, they, they went up overall 15% last year. That's, that's too much. That's much higher than uh, would be a normal level for housing, for housing prices to go up. I don't know what housing prices will do in the future. 
Um, but there's just a lot of demand. You know, there are people want to live in the, as you know, they want to live in the suburbs now. They want to move out of cities. They want bigger houses. Uh, they've saved all this money because they couldn't travel and they have to go to restaurants. So there's a lot of demand. So even even if mortgage rates go up, as they ultimately will, I think we'll we'll be looking at a lot of demand. Then the question will be how much supply can be brought to the market, and that's really out of our control. But as you know, when you look around your district, I mean, it's it's a question of zoning, it's a question of materials, labor, all those things. But but if I but if I could, if we if we zero in into the the material costs, we've seen that about thirty 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 six thousand dollar increase in cost due to the the material cost, largely inflation. Look at lumber and other areas. Maybe we'll continue this discussion offline. But appreciate your time as I'm out of time, and I will yield back. I'd be glad to do that. Thank you. The gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Adams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Chairman Powell, for being back with us. Uh, like uh, my colleagues who want to touch on inflation, uh, you have described current inflationary pressures as trans transitory and cited uh, supply uh, bottles and temporary factors like the high price of lumber as a reason why inflation has been high in recent months. And though this may be temporary, these bottlenecks have had real world consequences. For example, my local housing partnership has caused the construction of an affordable housing site because of a funding gap caused by the spike in lumber prices. And while lumber prices can be tied to the previous administration's actions, I know that many are still concerned about the rise in core prices. So I'm hoping that uh, you can help us put some of these concerns to bed. So would you tell us why you believe that the recent inflation trends are temporary as the economy reopens and what other factors are playing into the up, uh, upward pressure on prices? All these industries uh, kind of shut down a little more than a year ago on the expectation that we were looking at a really bad, difficult time. And then sooner than expected, uh, the economy is reopened and demand for housing and demand for many other things, cars, you name it, is really high because people saved. They didn't, you know, they saved money uh, with with all of the congressional fiscal support. Uh, more than 100% of income was income lost was replaced. So really, the consumer's in very good shape to spend. And so what's happening is there's a lot of demand, but on the supply side, it's just hard. Uh, they can't build enough houses. There wasn't enough lumber. You, you mentioned lumber prices. Lumber prices went way up, but they, and they, they've gone way down. They're not. They're still twice as high as they were before the before the pandemic came. But they're way off their highs. So we don't know it, but we we think that'll be the pattern for at least for some of these things where they go very very high and then they come down as as supply and demand you know come together as as more supply comes on the line to meet the higher demand. So it's we we have a very large but ultimately very flexible economy. It will adapt, we believe. It's not one of those economies that, that's rigid and has a lot of structural rigidities in it. Uh, it will adapt and, and fairly quickly, just as it adapted to the pandemic, much more quickly and better than, frankly, people expected. So I think that'll happen. And when that happens, we should see, uh, I don't say the prices will come back down, but, but the level of inflation will return to more normal. Okay, you know, even with the unemployment rate still elevated near 6%, the reports of employers are offering higher wages and incentives to attract workers back to work uh, in the workforce. And I've always said that working hard isn't enough if you don't make enough. So, Chairman Powell, what do you, what, what do you attribute the trend of workers receiving incentives to re-enter the workforce to? And does the Fed uh, view these conditions as favorable, even if the reasons for them are not? We're seeing this particularly in uh, service industries um, where there's still uh, lots and lots of job openings and many people who used to work in service industries, uh, next week. Uh, relatively low paid jobs, but we're seeing incentives to go back in. I mean, there clearly is a very, very high level of demand for people to come into these jobs. People are taking a little bit of time to look maybe for a better job. And knowing that they're going to go back, these are people who were working in 2020 in February. They want to work. These are people who want to work, right? But uh, they may be taking a little bit of extra time in many cases to look for a job that, that pays better or that they like better or, you know, their preferences for working from home may have changed. They might want to find a job where they can work from home. Who knows? But in any case, we're seeing 
difficulty in matching jobs and people up. And it, there's, there really isn't a precedent. We can't look back and see, well, the last time this happened, there is no last time that this happened. So we're, we're kind of finding, we're kind of finding out as we go, but I, I really do think come back in six months, there'll be a whole lot of these people back to work and okay. you know, wages will have moved up a little bit for people at the low end. And that's not a bad thing. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us today. Madam Chair, you're back. Thank you.